Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Super excited today. We are with our friends from CCW Safe. I've got Gary and Kyle here. We're going to talk today a little bit about the ins and outs of why someone might want concealed carry insurance. And we'll also probably delve into a couple specifics on lethal and um, rather ethical and lethal use of force and maybe why somebody could get themselves into a position where even insurance wouldn't save them. Hey guys. Thank you. So why don't we start real quick? We'll talk a little bit about uh, who you guys are, what you do at CCW Safe. I'll let either of you choose. One, two, three, go. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start first because Gary's, Gary's the background is a lot more interesting than mine. Uh, I uh, was a police officer in my previous professional life. Uh, and then I went to law school That's and cool. yeah, and I didn't want to read reports about people kicking in doors and shoving guns in people's faces for the rest of my life. So I have never been a criminal lawyer, never done any criminal defense. I, uh, been, I do civil cases. I defend healthcare systems and I defend uh, national fraternal order of police, uh, and officer involved shooting cases. Hmm. So that's been a passion of mine for my entire career. And, uh, I own my own law firm. I've been doing national uh, catastrophic healthcare cases for uh, the hospital systems and doctors is my bread and butter. And I started a company about seven years ago called CCW Safe with my stepbrother, Mike Darter and Stan Campbell, two other also uh, retired police officers. And we wanted to bring the kind of the fraternal order of police model of uh, protection to the civilian market because it didn't Mm -hmm. exist. And uh, having all in various ways been involved in officer involved shootings when we were police officers, we wanted to, in as civilians now, how do we have the same protection uh, as concealed carriers? And so there were no satisfactory uh, answer to it. So we just built it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Gary was our, our first uh, main hire. And uh, he has a long and distinguished career in homicide investigator and working as a UN uh, contractor in uh, the Balkans. And uh, so I'll let you kind of let Gary talk about him and what he does for us. He's our critical response coordinator and national affiliate manager. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, I'm, I'm Gary Eastridge. Uh, I'm critical uh, response coordinator for CCW Safe. I started with the Oklahoma State Police Department back in 79, then about 1997, a young patrolman named Mike Darter was involved in a in a, a lethal police use of force, and I was one of the investigating detectives on that. Um, after I retired in 2000, I went overseas, worked for, uh, for a year in Kosovo in uh, southern Serbia. Mm-hmm. Uh, ended up working homicide cases there for a year. Oh, wow. Um, after I came back, I, I worked a variety of contract jobs and then a friend of mine was elected district attorney and he made me chief investigator. I spent the last 10 years before starting with CCW safe, um, with one of my primary responsibilities, reviewing, um, police shootings and police uses of force that resulted in serious injury or death. So okay. over that 10 years, probably average somewhere around 12 to 15 per wow. year in so, our jurisdiction. So I would say that for the viewer or listener, depending on where you guys are at, you, you gentlemen involved in the company have a pretty broad depth of knowledge on crime, use of force, etc. Yes? I believe yes. so. I believe you're not, you're not going to toot, your, toot your own horn, of course, but it's not, you, you guys didn't come out of the uh, auto insurance world. And start selling, <laughs> uh, right. Right. Yeah, that's right. So I understand a little bit why you would want that same level of coverage that you had as officers. What does that mean for the layman? So average Joe opens up the computer, they Google concealed carry insurance and they see a plethora of stuff because as you guys know, 10, 15 years ago, there wasn't any of this. Right. So, uh, and, and, and then they see you guys and it says, okay, and this is not your sales pitch, but they, they can give me coverage like if I was a police officer. What does that mean? I know that's not your words, that's mine. 
Well, it's a great question. And essentially, there, I think you have to kind of deconstruct it and look at how can the, a, the legal justice system provide consequences for people who have a concealed carry permit if and when they use that weapon. And there's basically three ways. There's the criminal case that can be brought for uh, in the event that you were charged criminally, be it brandishing, uh, if okay. you display your weapon, it, you can be charged if you use it in shooting. You can have administrative uh, legal action taken against the permit itself. Uh, and then you can have civil uh, cases brought against you where they're wanting money. Uh, so the, the concealed carry insurance world, uh, that's what the ideal situation would be is if you have a company that you are a member of that provides you coverage for all three of those types of consequences that you have, civil, administrative, and criminal. And that's what the police officers have through the police union model or fraternal order of police, uh, the PBA, different types of organizations like that. You're a member, you get as a benefit. Uh, you're not going to have to ever pay for a lawyer. You're never going to get a bill for an expert witness or anything like that. And that's what we wanted to build for civilians. One thing I'll add, and I know you guys aren't aware of this, but to the listener, all of this is predicated upon righteousness in the sense that the person involved acted in accordance with the law and, and correct. Well, our competitors, uh, do have that. Most of them where if you're, if you're convicted of the criminal offense, you're screwed. You're not going to be covered. We wanted to, to the same type of, we didn't want an insurance policy per se, where they're not going to insure you against an intentional act. Uh, you know, as long as there, there is a self-defense defense, one of our members are going to be covered. We've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on questionable cases. And it ultimately would come down to if there's any reasonable defense of self-defense that is going to be allowed at the time of trial, then you're going to be covered. Because okay, so we, I may be negligent, Mickey. I could literally make an honest mistake that could provide criminal consequence to me. And we did not want our members to ever be in a situation where if they said, if the DA came to them and said, Mickey, we know you're a member. We think you're a bright guy, but you made a horrible mistake here. And this person's now dead, but we will, rather than go after you for manslaughter, we'll offer you disorderly conduct, a misdemeanor, and, uh, and, and we'll just make it go away, no jail time or anything. You might you go home and talk to your wife and kids about it and think, I can, get, I can have this done forever for a misdemeanor, uh, or I can face a manslaughter charge. I'm taking the misdemeanor any, every day of the week, twice on Sunday. Well, you just sure. voided your coverage and all other plans except for ours. We didn't want our members to be in a situation where if they felt they needed to admit some criminal culpability in order to get a better deal, we didn't want to be put in a situation where they say, well, I can't afford that. Now I'm going to have to pay back these lawyers who've been billed, you know, $200,000 in all the defense of this case to this point. Interesting. So I don't want to go too deep into the weeds on that because some people may get the wrong impression, but the point is, is the user, the client must have some self-defense claim it, i can't i can't just go out and murder somebody and of say, course right <laughs> absolutely <laughs> okay it, 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 you, you don't you should get the benefit of your all state car insurance policy uh if you accidentally run into the back of somebody you know i didn't see the stop sign okay well you shouldn't have to say well you you purchase insurance but if you ever actually need it we're going to deny your coverage you know that's 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 we don't want to didn't want our members to be subjected to anything like that. Sure. That makes great sense. I think the, I think the big difference is, is when that vehicle is not an accident and the person hammered on the gas and purposely drove into the rear end. That's the, the criminal aspect of it. So, well, that's the, and that would never be covered by any insurance or, sure. yeah, or, or us, you know, at that point it's an obvious intentional act, but if it's when, you know, concealed carriers are, are not unlike anyone else, ultimately the decision to, defend yourself is is a choice and it may be a choice that is easy to make because it's thrust upon you through no fault of your own but it is a choice it's a judgment that you make that you're judging that someone else's actions are uh, justifying your use of force mm -hmm. and because it's a human being making that judgment it could be wrong but if it was a judgment and it's it was in a reasonable belief of, uh, that you're in fear and therefore you know it's it's a self-defense situation then we're going to we're going to provide coverage. Makes good sense. You guys, I believe, uh, from the last time I had talked to Gary, have actually 
defended and protected and won some cases for clients, members. Yes. Uh, PW Safe, right? Yeah, we're the only ones who've actually uh, defended one of our members who literally been charged with first degree murder. Uh, it was a small jurisdiction in a rural area, and our member, who was a, a computer programmer, was attending. A, he was a motorcycle enthusiast, and he there was a women's organization that was having an anniversary. He attends attends it, and he was attacked three times uh, by a man about twice his size. And after the third attack, to prevent the third attack, which he felt was going to kill him, uh, he uh, uh, shot and eventually did kill the uh, the attacker. And so he was charged with uh, first degree murder. And uh, the in that case, it's it's what happened. We, what scares the hell out of us, Mickey, is we have all been on the law enforcement side, and we've seen some of the most amazing policing and detective work you've ever seen. Uh, but when you get into areas where they don't have it, where they have very limited experience dealing with, you know, how to handle physical evidence and forensic evidence and evaluation of evidence, and they don't in, they don't know how to interrogate people, they don't know how to question people, they don't have the re- financial resources and departments. Mm-hmm. You're, they're just going to charge you, let the jury figure it out. And so mm-hmm. we spent over $400,000 defending a man by the name of Stephen Maddox, who we did not want to disclose his name, but he wanted it out there because he wanted people to, to know about his experience. And you can find it online. It's uh, on our website, on YouTube. Uh, he tells his whole story and, and how uh, what his experience was like. And we even had a case last week, a shooting in uh, – in uh, the Western United States where one of our members was actually a member of three organizations, uh, CCW safe and two of, two of our competitors. But now Gary runs our critical response team, which is 24 seven anywhere in the United States where you, we will put boots on the ground within 24 hours. We'll get you out of jail. We'll hire lawyers who will come visit you. We'll get everything taken care of. Our competitors still have not even called this guy back. How long has it been? It's week. been a week. Over a week. Wow. Oh, yeah. It's been about Just, 10 days. Yeah. And, so and we actually, we had, uh, we had a, uh, Gary's brother is a, a private investigator who's a retired homicide detective. He was in Las Vegas is where this happened in 18 hours from the, okay. from the time of the, the report. Uh, we had the guy a lawyer. He's already now given his interview and we're awaiting what we believe will be a no charge from the district attorney's office. Which brings up, brings us back to a point you were asking earlier about uh, the same uh, benefit as a police officer. Most police officers, before they give that initial interview, whether it's a total righteous shooting or not, have legal representation Mm -hmm. via the FOP. The average concealed carrier, if he's involved in that situation, he's got the choice of going in on his own, unrepresented, um, maybe before he's ready and giving a statement where he, mm-hmm. everything he says may incriminate him. Sure. Uh, in sure. this case, we had an attorney set up. We worked with the local law enforcement. Uh, we scheduled the interview and he went in there represented. We had the attorneys with him uh, the day after the, uh, the incident. He actually didn't call us until the day after the incident when he didn't hadn't heard back from the other uh, competitors. So this guy wanted to hedge his bets and went and purchased policies or coverage with three different companies. Yes. yes. Interesting. That's interesting. And so we, it's got, not uncommon either, Mickey. Ironically, uh, you know, sometimes people will have their spouse insured at work even though she has a policy somewhere else. Uh, we've had that happen where they – like one thing about one company and another about another. And so they sign up for both. And uh, we, in those situations, we'll call our competitor and, uh, and work out who's primary or secondary, or, uh, you know, we're open to splitting uh, expenses or wh- whatever we can do that's in the best interest of the member. That's what they pay for. Makes good sense. I've, I've heard a few uh, digs on certain plans. One of them is, well, I want to pick my own attorney. I don't trust these guys to pick my attorney. And my thought is, if I n- knew what attorney I needed to hire, I probably wouldn't need these guys to begin with. I mean, maybe not wouldn't need you, but I don't have access to people that are specially trained in defending righteous self-defense cases. I know tons of criminal attorneys, but I'm not a criminal. I don't want a, cr- I don't want a criminal attorney. I want somebody to protect me because I didn't do wrong. So what do you say to that, to somebody that says, I want to be able to pick my own people? Well, uh, I say, good luck. Uh, you know, I hope you make the right choice because 
we don't hire, we vet every lawyer uh, thoroughly. In fact, it, uh, I, I am not a criminal defense lawyer. I, I've handled one criminal defense case and it was my wife's cousin who ran drunkenly onto a college football game after a victory for <laughs> trespassing. That's, I fled him out as fast as I could and never practiced criminal law again. Uh, my 21 years has, has been in the civil side of things. And so one of the first things we did uh, was we hired the most experienced criminal defense, self-defense lawyer in the world. Don West was one of the co-counsels for uh, George Zimmerman in the Trayvon Martin case. And Don is wired into the criminal defense, uh, the legitimate criminal defense bar. The guys who aren't hanging out at courthouses trolling $500 DUIs, sure. uh, you know, they're being high, brought in specifically for high profile cases all over the United States. Uh, Don is the one as national trial counsel. He, he uh, locates, it hires, vets, does the background, and all the lawyers who we hire for our members. Uh, so you're not getting a general practitioner. You know, you, you're not going to get a guy who, well, he did my cousin's divorce or, well, he drew up my will last week. With all right. due respect, I mean, uh, we don't want somebody who dabbles in criminal law or just somebody who's, a, oh, I love guns, therefore I'll, I'll defend you in your murder case. Right. It, it, it's, it's a major issue for a member if you have a lawyer who, for the first time in their life, is getting experience on your case. Uh, you know, I, wanted, I want a, a lawyer who is already experienced. You know, look, get your get your experience. It, it, experience comes from what? They, there's a saying uh, that good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want the person who already has the experience, who learns from mistakes they made on someone else's cases, not on sure. mine. Sure. And so that's the that's the ethos that we bring to the way we hire lawyers. With that said, if you know somebody. Uh, Mickey, if you've had a guy in your class who was a lawyer who impressed you and, and uh, you had a self-defense incident and, and uh, you know, made your claim and we send our team out and you say, I really would like Joe Blow and we look into it and Joe Blow's an experienced self-defense lawyer, then he'll be your guy. Uh, gotcha. And, and, but at the same time, uh, you know, you're going to, you're going, our whole point is we want you to have the best lawyer in your area who's experienced handling that type of case. And, uh, it, and if it, it's your guy, great. Then we'll look forward to developing a relationship with them. And they will be blown away by the resources that we will push at your criminal defense case or your civil case or whatever it is. We have a, I've already we have a lot of, I'm, I'm sorry, Mick, I was no, just going to add, we have a lot of law enforcement members who uh, join for off-duty coverage. Almost every cop knows who the best attorneys are around. I have a lot of them that send me the attorney's name. We get it pre-vetted. If that's the attorney they want and that attorney has the experience, that's who they get. Makes sense. I argued it to some folks like, like this because I've been in business 20 years. I, I, if, if I owned the business, it wouldn't behoove me to find somebody that wasn't going to do a good job for my client or customer because then all of a sudden my business looks bad and uh, I'm, it only takes one or two times for some, something to go sideways and then that stuff's out on the internet. And yeah, well, one end. of our competitors lists uh, – who their lawyers are in certain areas on their website. And I would encourage you, uh, if anybody uh, wants to know the caliber of the lawyers that are hired by some of our competitors, if they post who their lawyers are, look at, go look at them. You will find people who just graduated law school six months ago and have hung out a shingle and have never tried a criminal case. Or, or, yeah, or they're, like I say, a general practitioner who, God bless them, they know more about more areas of the law than I ever will. Mm-hmm. Uh, I practice, I'm a specialist in one niche area and, uh, that's the one that we hire for our members is we, we hire lawyers who have already tried all these types of cases and have the battle scars. Another thing that, that we do just in the, uh, that I think would maybe be of interest to your listeners is, uh, we throw resources at, at our, uh, at, at our lawyers who we hire we have actually even sent some of them to uh, you know, forensic evidence academies where they learn to have a better understanding, uh, con- continuing legal education. We send them to week-long seminars on how to better represent somebody in a, in a self-defense case. We, have, we, we provide Don West, who's our national trial counsel, uh, he and Gary, for the one we had last, uh, last summer, the murder case, they actually spent weeks in the pretrial period, working with the witness, doing mock cross examination with him, because the it, it was a case that we felt strongly, though, and particularly the the lawyers, trial lawyers who were handling it, felt very strongly that the the only way we could win that case is putting uh, the criminal defendant, our member, on the stand because he had to articulate his self defense defense, 
And mm-hmm. so in order, when you put somebody on the stand in a criminal defense case, uh, you know, they better be prepared and they, be, and they better be a good witness and they better not look like they've been, you know, too rehearsed. And sure. so it's, it's a real art to doing it. We employ uh, video, uh, which video is a way to basically create stress inoculation for the member. Uh, we, we hammer them from different perspectives. You jump around. There's a lot of ways that we do mock interrogations. Uh, you know, we, everything we can do to best prepare that member to go in there when so much is at stake. Yeah. Makes good sense. I, I, to anybody listening, if you were to ask me which policy I have, it's through these guys. So I didn't come to that, though. They didn't call me and say, hey, you've got a social media following, sell our stuff. I came to them after a year of... Uh, looking at all the policies that were available, but then even more importantly, talking to some of the people that ran the the businesses. And there's nothing wrong with a business making a profit. That's why businesses exist. But when you look at some of them and you can tell that they're more concerned with bottom line than anything else, that's like, "Eh, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested. So uh, just full disclosure to those listening, I I do use this service myself. Hopefully I never have to, but uh, it's the one that, that we insure um, myself through or cover myself. You're not an insurance company, right? Well, we have a different uh, model. And frankly, uh, I've been working with captive insurance companies for nearly my entire career. Uh, captive insurance is something that most Fortune 500 companies have them. Uh, it basically allows, if you're going to have a self-insurance pool, it'll, it's, it essentially serves as the funding mechanism for your claims. So the way to look at it is there's in the traditional insurance world, there's two buckets. There's the expense bucket, which is legal fees, copy expenses, uh, court filings, you know, expert witnesses, investigators, that thing. And then there's the indemnity. And that's when you actually pay uh, settlements or verdicts. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it is makes it incredibly uh, financially responsible to create an independent a uh, captive insurance company to serve as the funding mechanism. So a portion of every membership that gets sold goes into a fund that is able to be invested and grow and always will be there to, uh, to service the, the members to give them what they paid for. Another thing that we do is, it, most importantly, I think, in the United States, traditional commercial insurance goes through England. You may have your, your local state farm policy for your car that has a hundred thousand dollar policy, a portion of that is always going to be through the Lloyd's of London syndicate uh, in the form of reinsurance or excess coverage. So State Farm will only retain a very small amount of that of, of the risk of your auto claim. They then report up to multiple layers of, of uh, reinsurance and excess coverage. So what we do is we have our own insurance company and we use what's called first dollars. We don't have a retention where we have to pay a certain amount. We, our reinsurance carriers are involved with the first dollar of, of our risk. And the reason we do that is because it allows us the ability to, if we had a situation, and I, one example I like to give is that uh, the Waco, Texas biker shootout at that Twin Peaks restaurant. Mm. Okay, if those were all law-abiding citizens, and put the criminal issues, aside, you know, the motorcycle gang issues aside and just think that was a Bible study and there, you know, 60 people all, you know, opened up on somebody uh, and you've got 60 claims occurring at the same time and you can't have one lawyer represent all those 60 people because they're conflicted out. So now you get to hire 60 lawyers and you've got all these claims and, you know, you're going to rack up hundreds of thousands of dollars instantly. Uh, mm-hmm. What is the best way to, to, to incur that financial loss? in a responsible way that allows you to continue to be there and liquid for all of the other potential claims you may have. And so we have designed the only in the, our industry way to do that and not be subject to the whims, the political whims of the commercial insurance market, like what we've seen in New York and New Jersey, uh, where Mm -hmm. they have to pull out where they can be attacked for their, their being a second amendment friendly, uh, organization. So what, what Kyle's talking about, guys, is there are states that have basically forced companies like CCW Safe and others out of their state, saying that it's against their state constitution to have said type of coverage, correct? Well, yeah, yeah, because what they do is historically, it, a, it is, there's a public policy reason to preclude insurance companies from insuring against intentional acts. And it's literally the first thing you'll learn in insurance law 101 if you're in law school 
is they'll give you case examples of when someone uses their automobile as a weapon in the, in the example you gave earlier. Uh, you can't, your insurance is not going to pay for that because it was an intentional act. We mm-hmm. want people to be ultimately responsible for intentional acts because then they'll be more, less likely to do them, right? right? If they can have an insurance policy that, that essentially makes them immune to any consequences for their behaviors, that's what people might, might do. So the public policy reason precludes insurance companies from doing that. But when you are your own insurance company and you're not subject to uh, the insurance regulations in a particular given state because your insurance is owned for your own risk, our own risk. So, you know, we own our own insurance company. It's our risk. We're not, we're, we're not insuring directly the member. We're insuring ourselves and make, creating the funding mechanism to pay the membership benefit, which is all of the expense money and potentially if they have the, the ultimate plan, the civil liability ex- indemnity portion as well. Mm-hmm. So th- we felt this was, as if we're an American-owned and operated company, and we do not want any of our reinsurance to go through Lloyd's of London, uh, where it's the risk of firearms ownership is not understood, and it's essentially uh, financially uh, you know, a- attacked because they don't understand uh, the firearms world. They don't understand the Second Amendment community. It's right. really, from a risk analysis standpoint, there are very, very few claims that uh, gun ranges, you know, commercial uh, manufacturers, they have very low loss claims, yeah. claims histories, which is what pricing should be based on. So we base, we're able to, because we own our own insurance company, we're not in the commercial market, we are able to actually provide a, a cost effective solution that is based on actual, you know, pricing that's based on risk. Uh, so, w- w- cause we understand it. We run our own claims. we manage sure. them ourselves. So we see this, we actually publish our, our claims information as well. We talk about that when we regularly do this because we think ultimately it's not, it's not just in our best interest financially for a company not to have a bunch of claims. It obviously it is, but it's also in the best interest of our members. If we can provide them education, like what you do on your podcast, the number one thing you have on yours is awareness, mm-hmm. right? And, and the, why do you yeah. have awareness on there, Mickey? Because you're a bright guy and you want, your, you want the people who take classes from you to avoid, to perceive the risk and avoid it if they can. And it's the same way with what we do. It's, it's, if you provide somebody information, they will make a better uh, choice and decision. I was going to comment. That was my next comment. The other thing you guys do besides the actual coverage, and I know this isn't just indicative of CCW safe, but I get an email from you guys. I'm guessing it's probably once a week or so. You've taken different cases, uh, broken them down. You look at they're they're bite sized chunks, you know. So you don't have to sit down and be. I'm not telling this to you guys, but to the listener, it's so that you're not having to be a a, a legal professional to understand. And it's broken down into bite sized chunks. Maybe something that could take you a few hours to digest in totality, but you can take five minutes and see the aspects of uh, uh, an encounter that led to uh, a citizen probably cuffed up. Uh, the last one that you mentioned, the gentleman from. Uh, uh, the first story. What was his last name again? Stephen Maddox, the one in. Uh, Maddox. Yes, that was uh, that was out at Sturgis. No, was, he was in North Carolina. North Carolina. Okay, I'm way off. I knew it was a motorcycle gig. I just assumed. Uh, I did actually read all of that, and like that, that in itself, that's a that is a tough case when you sit and read through that. Like my brain's screaming as I'm reading it, but it gives the 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 customer, the viewer, the listener, so much information that they can, I hate using the term, but more tools in the toolbox. What you see though is just common sense. Like, dang, that's how that worked out. And all it would have required was this for not, for that not to happen. I've had somebody said to me, well, they only pass that on because it will stop people from having to need their policy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, like, that's exactly why. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Were you going to say something, Gary? I was just going to say, and the thing you don't get from us is marketing emails. Yeah. What you get from us is 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 case studies, things that provoke thought. And yeah, we 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 are firm believers that a trained and uh, educated carrier is a smart carrier and is a low risk. Hmm. It's, it's interesting to me, I, you listen to, I had a, a guy in class a couple of weeks ago down in Texas, a uh, young man, former military police, comes to the front door, we're actually scheduled to do a podcast with him, comes to his front door because he hears a commotion out in the driveway, and this would be a good 
uh, one that I will dovetail in and ask you guys some questions on. He turns on the light and sees some dude out in his driveway just going to town, punching his fender of his truck up. So he's like, what in the heck is going on? His wife's in bed. They live in a neighborhood. He flips the lights on, opens the door a crack and says, hey, man, what are you doing? And the guy's ranting and raving and screaming. And he realizes by what the guy says that he's at the wrong house. So he uh, he's telling him, hey, man, get get out of here. You get the wrong house. And he's going to his plan is to call, grab the phone, but his phone's in the other room and he's going to call the the police, but he doesn't want to take his eyes off this guy. And this is only a few seconds into this noise happening. He tells the guy to leave. The guy starts approaching him. He says, hey, don't come any closer. Get the heck out of here. The guy basically charges him. He points his gun at him. He says, I'm going to shoot you if you don't stop. The guy starts screaming, ranting and raving, telling him he's going to kill him. He's going to shove the gun up his rear end, et cetera, et cetera. This guy says, it, it, in the student of mine says, in hindsight, he would have shot him sooner. He waited until the guy was contact that muzzle was into his chest and it took him like three or four rounds to get the guy to stop advancing on him well they found out the police come his wife wakes up comes out what the hell's going on and they find out this guy has got a rap sheet a mile long he's been to prison for armed robbery home invasions he's at this house thinking that it's his girlfriend's lover and he's there to <laughs> coax him out of the house and beat him up so this guy ends up going to jail for a night or two and, and is found to not have not done anything wrong. But we talked about it and he talked about it. You know, should I have just gone in the house, closed the door, barricaded myself in, called 911. And he just, the way he articulated it, it was just, it happened so fast. He thought like, is this guy going to come start beating my door down? My, I believe pregnant wife is 10 feet from the door in the bedroom. And that's the way it played out. What, uh, what I think people don't understand is state by state, that situation. This is the great state of Texas. If that was the great state of New York, for example, or uh, somewhere on the, that part of the country, it might have been a completely different scenario. I'll let you comment. Well, I, I'll talk first about, I think what you made a point there at the end, I think is absolutely yeah. incredibly important is every state is different. And uh, the one, one of our industry partners that uh, we really want people to focus on if you're a concealed carrier is a company called Legal Heat. Uh, Legal Heat is an app that you can get that lists all of the concealed carry firearms related laws in all the states. But I'm most importantly, it, it very easily, if you're going to, I have a house in Colorado, so I drive through New Mexico, Texas all the time. And laws can change. And so every time I, before I go, I make sure, you know, has there been a magazine restriction in Colorado? Do I need to change what gun I'm going to take? Do I need to, uh, you know, do, am I going to be, is my uh, permit going to be recognized still in New Mexico? Uh, you, plan your trips using legal heat. Look at them up regularly because the laws are different. Things like stand your ground, all that kind of stuff is, uh, is really important to know where you are. I think Gary brings an interesting perspective to this because before you, you can have criminal defense lawyers or civil lawyers like myself can give all this advice, but ultimately the, there's some, somebody standing between uh, the event and you getting a lawyer, and that's the, the initial law enforcement response who's going who's gonna, to, that di district attorney is going to listen very carefully to before he or she decides to bring charges. So I think it'd be important for Gary to kind of talk about from that story that you told, Mickey, the perspective of that. Uh, how the homicide investigator is going to look at that. Well, mm -hmm. uh, the thing I want to kind of touch on real quick is not only are the laws different in every state, Texas, for example, where that occurred, the way the law on self-defense is viewed in Austin is very different than how it is in uh, Fort Worth. You're, uh, you're referring to the, the consensus of the citizens there, their customs, their habits. Their habits, the, the political leanings of the district attorneys. Most district attorneys are elected officials. Uh, they're going to cater uh, to the, the, the people that elected them. So right if on. you're in a more liberal or, or less self-defense friendly jurisdiction, watch your actions may be viewed in a lot more restrictive 
um, from a lot more restrictive viewpoint than, say, in a, a more conservative or a more uh, self-defense friendly jurisdiction. So, so even though the law is the same, the, the way that law is interpreted can be different. And that's where I think it's important. One of the benefits of being a member of, of us, uh, of our firm, is that prior to him doing any uh, interview or anything like that, he's going to have a homicide. A, a Somebody with investigative experience is going to come sit down with him and say, Here's what you can expect. Here's where you what you what you probably should have done this different. But let's deal with what what occurred. You can't take that back. Nothing you can do, right or wrong, can be changed. You can only put it into the proper perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's real important to be able as a concealed carrier. You might not know what's important for that district attorney to have available to him uh, in, in helping him reach his decision on sure. filing or not filing. Um, so having the experience to come and kind of guide you through that, uh, I think is, is significant and important. Uh, I know that it, I worked in a prosecutor's office for 10 years you're at the mercy of the case the law enforcement brings you. We had mm -hmm. 17 jurisdictions in Oklahoma County. We didn't get the same level of investigation from all 17 jurisdictions. Uh, so, you know, you had to, you had to take uh, what was provided to you and try to render a, a judgment. And some of that information may or may not have been biased by the investigators, by the uh, folks involved. Yeah. And that's, I think, something I'd like to just pop in here so the listeners understand this. Regardless even of the cops and investigators, the Sixth Amendment that gives us the right to a, a fair trial by a jury of our peers, you live in the north side of Chicago, your jury of your peers are people that by and large don't like guns. So I just, I'm, I'm trying to paint that picture in as many ways as possible. So people understand that it's not just, this is the problem when folks say it's my right. It is. And then the people that live around you get to interpret whether or not what you did Absolutely. was right. Absolutely. They get a vote too. And, and, yeah. and that's the thing that we always tell people the importance of knowing where you are. And, and like you have on your website, awareness is so important. It's also, it's, it's not just a thing you can occasionally do. You know, awareness is not like uh, a holster where I mean, you get, you do a different one. We're depending on where you're going. It's you have to have it all the time because you could be in a jurisdiction. Uh, you know, in there, and there's your. Let's take St. Louis for example. Drive ten minutes one way, and you're in East St. Louis. Yeah. You know, drive ten minutes the other way, and you're on somebody's farm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and ultimately, the district attorney for those two different counties maybe wildly divergent in their political aspirations. And maybe one of them uh, needs to make a name for themselves. And uh, you have to think about, you know, where you are. And if you have, if the, uh, the demographics of the person who attacks you uh, come into play as well, and the optics on that can be incredibly different. And I think it's a really important point to make that we tell people all the time is be your, your own risk manager. You know, do things to mitigate your risk. Here's a perfect example. Uh, if you were involved in a use of force shooting, what's one of the first things the law enforcement uh, arm is going to do? They're going to get on. They're going to take your computer. So it's not like, well, I'll be sure and get home when, after, when they let me out of jail and I'll clean up my social media profile. You don't have one. They, took, they, take, they own your computer and your phone now. All right. So they have those. And they're going to be able to get on your uh, social media accounts. And they're going to look at all of that data and they're going to see your T-shirt that says uh, from my cold, dead hands. Or they're mm -hmm. going to see your T-shirt that says, you know, warrior God or something like that. <laughs> Kill them all, let God sort them out. You're actually d going right into the, the next question I was going to ask. Keep going. Yeah. And th those are my only point is Huge. that is evidence of your mindset. And it's really important. You know, it's harder to argue at trial that you have a you carry because you want to protect your your family 
uh, you have a job that that you where you deposit money at the bank. So you you need to be able to articulate why you have a gun in the first place. Uh, even though yes, it's your constitutional right, but you're going to look like a jerk. Uh, to people on a jury who most of them are going to be ambivalent about gun rights anyway. You're going to have two or three people who are adamant Second Amendment advocates, two or three people who are ad who could who are the exact opposite, and everybody else is going to be completely subject to being convinced one way or the other because they don't have a they don't really have skin in the game of the gun mm -hmm. debate. So mm -hmm. you need to appear as reasonable as you possibly can. You need to look like that this event was forced on you and you had absolutely no choice. You don't want to look like you are just walking around this world waiting for your chance to have a gunfight. So what would you say to this? Here's a question I get in class settings or online a lot. And I have, I have my view on it, but I want to hear yours. So uh, don't modify your gun because if you've modified it to make it shoot faster or more accurately, a, a state's attorney or a uh, prosecutor could try to articulate that you were intending it to be more lethal, more deadly because you wanted to be out, be out there hurting somebody. That's one question. It's a couple or the point you just made. So like the backstrap on a Glock, people will replace those with maybe an American flag or, or the Punisher logo. Or, yeah. Or the Punisher logo or yeah, something like that. Or the um, muzzle that says smile and wait for flash. Yeah. 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 So, so, you just kind of answered that, but let's go to like the tuning up the gun, like a trigger job or something like that. And I'm not talking about from a safety aspect. So like that's off the table. Like we know we shouldn't be carrying around weapons that are unsafe, but if somebody goes out and say, sends their, their, their Smith and Wesson to the performance center and has a really nice trigger job done to it, that's safe. Is that wrong for a concealed carrier? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think, uh, it, it, it depends on if you let your your cousin Earl, who's never been to gunsmithing school, and I have these guys in my family. That's what I'm saying, and their name Earl. Uh, <laughs> you know, they've been they they like working on guns, and just let me have your 1911, Kyle, and I'll tune it up for you. And you know, if that's a big difference than sending your you know your 1911 to the Kimber Custom Shop or Performance Center, that's the manu that's a it's a known manufacturer. It's a it's a recognized standard in the industry. There are people who are properly trained. They've been through the armor school of whatever manufacturer of the type of gun that you carry. Uh, and I think those are, those are completely reasonable things. And it's important to, to, to think in advance. And so you can articulate to somebody mm -hmm. who doesn't know anything about guns, why you sent your gun off to the Smith and Wesson performance center, or you sent your, you, you installed the a Zev or a agency arms, uh, or, you know, Vickers tactical uh, trigger modification. Well, I did that because it, you know, I've already thought about this. So my, my response to that is, and I have all these types of guns, I want a consistent trigger pull uh, that allows me to more safely and accurately use my gun in the event I had to defend myself. You know, right. And I'm not going to paint, uh, you know, zombie colors on it or anything like that. And I don't buy zombie killer ammunition. I buy the exact same rounds that the local police department where I live issues their officers. And, uh, and I think that's an ammunition is another really important uh, point because if your ammunition is a Hornady defense, that's, e that's an easy thing. It's defense. I'm, this gun is designed to defend yourself sure. and is not an offensive weapon in the way that you're going to be using it. Now, if it said, if it was a super aggressive uh, name on that ammunition, then, you know, so uh, uh, yeah, exactly. That's, that's something that would give rise to a mindset or an attitude that you have that the prosecutor would really take advantage of. Nick, I can tell you from my experience, I, I, I'm not, I can't remember a single case where a gun modification became an issue in a criminal case or in a homicide investigation. I will say that if there is a problem with the case, if there is some questionable uh, that balance becomes uh, whether to file or not file, Something like that. Could then you get then you look a little deeper. Exactly. If it, and like Kyle touched on, if it makes you look like you were going for a gunfight, uh, if you were if if you give anything to give that appearance that it's an offensive weapon rather than a defensive weapon. Mm -hmm. I I kind of work off this 
premise, besides the reasonable man doctrine, I think to myself, if I'm justified, I'm justified. If somebody has to look at the back plate on my Glock to try to figure out my motives, then I probably already screwed up because if I had to be pushed to violence like that, it, I wish for it to be that clear. Of course, we don't get to decide when violence visits us. Otherwise, we could just stay home if that was the case, right? No, no premeditated self-defense, as they say. But it, 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 um, it seems like too many folks invest too much energy rather than just l- energy and things like that, rather than just looking at how can I avoid it to begin with, or how can I uh, develop the mindset of avoidance and de-escalation and living at peace? Because if I carry this gun, this is not for you guys, but I carry these things so that I live to be an old, healthy man. And if I do things that invite violence, then I'm, that's counterintuitive to my mindset of living to be a healthy old man. Our COO, Stan Campbell, has a saying that don't do anything with that gun that you wouldn't do without that gun. Right on. If you, if you let that, if you let that gun, if you let your, your sidearm boost your uh, ego, ego and yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's a great point Gary makes, Mickey, that and, uh, you've probably seen it. We share with our members our, our claims information. And the number one claim that we have that we've defended countless times all over the country is the claim of brandishing. And in every one of these instances, it, with the exception of shooting cases where, you know, your mutual combatants are both armed or whatever. But in the brandishing cases, it's because somebody, usually a man in their late 40s to early 60s, uh, they have had a concealed permit for less than five years. They don't have a long standing history necessarily uh, guns. They haven't had a tremendous amount of training. Uh, they just got their permit. You know, they, they shot, you know, 25 holes in a paper target, passed the background check, did their fingerprints, and now they carry a gun to defend themselves. And it, invariably, they put themselves in situations where, you know, they, they all regret it afterwards. They get out of there. They have a road rage incident. By God, that young punk who just cut me off, I'm going to, I'm, you know, they're not going to pull this crap on me anymore. And he, they display their gun. Oh, and it, it's happened over and over and over and over again. And so, you know, don't do anything with the gun you wouldn't do without it. That is an absolute great mindset thing to have. But invariably, if you get out of your car and want to go confront somebody, why? Mm-hmm. You know, if you, because now you've got a gun and you can do it. it. You know, we see these men get to a certain age, and I, I'm not trying to speak on men, but you get to a certain age, you know, I'm as mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore. And you get to a point where I'm sick of, you know, of having living under everybody's thumb and being the guy that people take advantage of and they cut me off in traffic. I'm never going to have to put up with that again. A gun does not make any of those problems better. It only makes them worse. You not know, to mention we don't know who else has a gun. You, you don't. And uh, I, when I was a young patrol officer many, many years ago, my, uh, my field training officer uh, said, you know, uh, you, you better hope that uh, that gun doesn't have a front sight if you take it out, if you, if you pull it out and point it at the wrong guy too soon, because he'll take it and shove it right up you. And that front <laughs> sight sure is going to hurt. And, of course, this was on a GP100 revolver, so which is okay. the front sight is about an inch tall, so, yeah, it would hurt. <laughs> yeah. But, that's a, you know, when you're a civilian and you're carrying a gun on you, that is an awesome responsibility. Yeah. And it is a very serious thing. And, uh, if you, and if you make the decision to pull that gun out, then it better be absolutely spot on right. I mean, if you're if you're if you're wrong, that's what we're here for. You know, we're mm-hmm. we're here for to protect you in the event you know, make a mistake. But uh, we we hate to to see that what happens to people when they've been charged with a felony and brandishing, which in California, you know, it is a felony. And every DA in, in California, just about, is looking to make, it, make a name for themselves politically. And one of the best ways to do that there is to go after somebody who, who was issued a concealed carry permit by a sheriff who they have a major political uh, disagreement with. Mm-hmm. So just be, be your own risk manager and recognize that, uh, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. You know, just because right this on. person cuts you over, don't get out of your car. There's a, a great video by John McPhee, sheriff of Baghdad, who sure. talks about de-escalation. And he's in a car, and he's probably one of the most dangerous men on the planet. <laughs> and he did singleton missions in Afghanistan with Delta, and he's just, you know, a guy that uh, you would think would have no problem 
uh, you know, getting out of his car and anybody in the world and, 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 and kicking their butt and not having anything to worry about. And the video demonstrates somebody beating all over his car while he's inside of it. And it's just, hey, you're in your car. You're in a safe place. The doors are locked. Just call 911. You know, you don't need to escalate that situation by getting out or rolling your window down or flipping them off or yelling at them. You know, they're not going to, the traffic will move and you'll be able to pull out. It, a lot of the times we've seen it's car to car, vehicle road rage type situations over parking spaces or who's going to get to leave the parking lot first. Uh, these are where these incidents happen. Mm -hmm. I have told many of men in my life, you shouldn't have a gun. <laughs> if you if you're the kind of guy that will go to deadly force over parking spaces or or things like that uh you you probably shouldn't have a gun it's it's uh it it definitely does not do anything but amplify the the issues right yes I, just because you can doesn't mean you should right right and that i think for a lot of people i find with myself and in most of the folks i pal around with it uh it gives me pause, not because uh, it, 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 for me to leave my house armed or unarmed, it doesn't change much other than I know if I do something stupid uh, with, with a gun on me, even if I go out, have a couple beers at the bar and get pulled over, I can lose my gun rights in Illinois for that. You know, so there's like great, great consequences uh, to, to very mi little mistakes. One of my uncles, hit, bad advice. But great advice. He says, never do more than one dumb thing at a time. So, <laughs> yeah, one, one point two on that, Mickey, that people sometimes forget about is if you're going through a divorce, a, a breakup, and uh, women will, and this is men, I'm sure the same thing, I don't mean to pick on, on women. Here, I actually, where you're going with this, I recently had a man do this to a woman in our family. So go, go ahead. Yeah, and, and they basically, they make a complaint of domestic violence. Uh, and part of the divorce, part of the temporary order uh, that can happen when people separate or file for divorce is, uh, uh, you know, that you can't have any firearms. Mm -hmm. depending, mm -hmm. on what, depending on where you are. And if that woman or the man knows that, like my wife, if she wanted to, you know, mess with my daily routine, uh, and we were getting divorced, she would, all she'd have to do is say, I feel threatened because he has guns and mm -hmm. she could res completely restrict my access to them. Uh, and when you're going through divorce, you're not looking to help the other person out and help them in enjoy their hobbies and things they like sure. to do. You're looking to hurt them any way you can. So just be, I, I encourage men and women out there who are gun owners who may be going through any type of contemplating or going through it, uh, you know, recognize that that is a nuclear option. And, uh, you know, you might want to think about being nice. I agree. I think all of the things we're talking about for the most part, the true acts of, of criminal violence predators, and you guys know this better than most is, is very slim. Most of the, most of the altercations I've seen in my life or been party to all started with ego. It wasn't the, a social predator that was out hunting men or, or uh, uh, you know, a, a rapist, a, a serial killer or something like that, or just a, a, a violent street thug. It started with ego. I saw a guy get his jaw broken once when we were in our early 20s over two dudes at a bar just start the stupid BS pushing, you know, F U F U and it escalated to a guy having his jaw wired shut for six months. And I remember like after the fact, looking at both of them, like that, that was smart. You know, like exactly. you're going to jail and you are disfigured yeah. for the rest Who's of your life. The winner? Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, nobody wins that stuff. So I try to always remind people of that. Like it's very few and far between that you have these actual occurrences that one needs to, deploy this level of force right well and that, i think that, that's a great point and obviously we all carry because we do know that it, it is possible you know if, if it was probable that you're going to need your gun who the hell would take a handgun you'd take an ar <laughs> sure uh so you know a handgun is, is for the possibility of use not the probability of use and uh one thing that we see a lot of that i, I we get a lot of questions about are you know people essentially their everyday carry uh, looks like they're, you know, a contractor in Syria. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you want to carry a tourniquet and a pocket knife, I mean, those are, that's easy to articulate because 
you could come you could or you're apt to more apt to use your tourniquet in a car accident than you are in a shooting so what, is it a bad idea to have a tourniquet on you or in your car or in your medical medical kit no it's not a bad idea at all it's easy to to defend but when you see somebody with a you know a, a three knives and uh you know a jury's going to hear about that you know, Jerry will hear about that. They're going to think, magazine. what the yeah. hell, paranoid? Yeah, exactly. You know, I carry a spare magazine because, you know, the old saying, you know, two is one and one is none. Right. On. Uh, any, any, any guy who has a toolbox on a jury is going to understand that, you know, things can fail and I have a backup here, not because I want to shoot more rounds, but in case the first one doesn't work. Uh, and, but if you're carrying, you know, three, three spare mags and a boot knife and a couple of knives on your belt and, and it's, and, and you've got two tourniquets and you've got, uh, I mean, you know what I'm talking. You've seen these types of, of, Tac of tactical things. Tactical Timmy, sure. Yeah, exactly. And it it, it starts to uh, tell someone a story about you that is inconsistent with why you're doing what you're doing. It, it's that you're looking for this, and uh, and it just be very mindful of, of uh, you know how you are. And we get the, the whole uh, people decked out in you know five elevens and. Uh, we mm -hmm. call them the shoot me first vests. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody the more tactical you look is you're identifying yourself as 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 somebody who may have a gun on them or in their car. And the if you get out and you have got gun bumper stickers all over your car, guess whose car? If I'm a criminal and I want to, I want to get me a gun that isn't traced. I'm going to break into and I can break into a Cadillac that says coexist bumper sticker on it or I can break into the truck that has Glock stickers on it. Which one am I more apt to get a gun from? Meat is murder. Exactly. Yeah, right. right. Hey, Probably not going to find a gun in that car. One of our students from uh, uh, Seattle just had his car broken into a couple of days ago and they stole his uh, pistol. I think he went into a federal building. They stole his pistol yeah. and he had a uh, 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 AR pistol. So some junkie popped the yeah. window and just gra grabbed his bag and took off, and that's that stuff happens like crazy. I was going to say on that that thread of what you're going on, I hear this a lot. Hey, even if I want to dress this way, I want to carry all these weapons. It's my right. It's. I, are you guys hearing that notification coming through my computer? No. No. Okay. If that, I just want to make sure you're not hearing it, I'm shut it off here. The uh, the it's my right thing is great. And I get it, but I also don't want to create a situation like what you're saying where I'm stacking the odds against me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big problem. People assume this like idea of liberty allows us to somehow skew the minds of others. Like, yeah, you can dress like that. You can do all that. And unless you have some airtight case where there's five cameras watching you getting mugged at the ATM and you had to do it, you are going to be open to, to, uh, uh, the, the, the microscope getting put on you. Absolutely. One thing I think uh, you won't find a bigger advocate for, you know, the most expansive interpretation of the second amendment as, as I am and Gary is, and I'm sure you are as well, but my mindset about it is, and I'll fight for everybody to, to classify it as, as a right. It's a constitutional right. It to me, it's a, it's a, it goes beyond just that. It to me, it's a civil right. You know, uh, and, and it infuriates me that I have a, a wonderful Second Amendment uh, rights in Oklahoma and Texas, and uh, and I have very questionable Second Amendment rights in Colorado. It's still okay, mostly good, but in uh, in Washington and Oregon sure. and New Jersey, uh, I no one would ever accept that they're they have less of a right of free speech in one state than they do in another. But that's what that's our second amendment right is, is, is have happening to it. And one, one of the, the biggest problems we have is sometimes we're our own worst enemies. And the, the more adamant you are about, uh, an aggressive one is about arguing about it's a right, it's my God given right and all that. It's uh, it's ultimately that could serve to be the greatest risk to our second amendment rights. I think of it in my mind as a privilege uh, because that alters, it, it, then I have to be, I have to be very sensitive and protected of my privilege, even though it's a right. It, I absolutely 100% agree it's a right, but I treat it in my mind like a privilege because I take better care of it because right. it could go away. And I want to hold on. I want to be able to carry my gun concealed. I think of that as a privilege because if it's a privilege, I take better care of it. 
I like that. I try to remind people when they use that argument. Well, just for example, was it a day or two ago was the anniversary of the repeal of the Volstead Act. The, the Constitution has been amended many times, and it, it probably will be in the future. A hundred years ago, women couldn't vote. Once upon a time, you could own a person. So it's, uh, it's something that we definitely have to be good stewards of. As a, a Second Amendment educator in our state, I work with, uh, I preside over one organization and work with a few others. And we'll go to the state capitol and I tell guys, like, you don't have to have a fitted suit like a lawyer or, uh, you know, uh, some fancy clothes. But for gosh sakes, you could go to Walmart and buy a polo in a clean pair of slacks, you know, instead of showing up to the to the, the uh, state capitol with a t-shirt on that says like, you know, some stupid gun business and uh, you've got your tactical Timmy pants on and, and boots and stuff. Like, I know that's how you dress, but you must also understand that the customs of today and the way people are, uh, uh, we're predisposed to judge based on looks, whether you like it or not. So when you're trying to win people over to our way of thinking, it's hard when you have a lot of people proliferating that. Yeah. You guys that's probably. That's a great point. That is a great point. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, and that's like a hard one. It's, you're telling somebody like, hey, man, you look like a dirt bag. Dress up before you come with me. <laughs> but, but that's the way it works. My father was a minister growing up. He always had a suit and tie on. If you went to the grocery store at nine o'clock at night, he'd throw his coat on and straighten his tie. And I always, as a kid, would pay attention. The clerk would say, sir, can I help you? Now, if there was some other guy that was in there, like, with his coveralls on, covered in grease, nobody ran up to that guy. It's not, it's not right or wrong. It's just human nature. And so I think we need to, to be better effective communicators about the, these rights. Uh, we got to think about that because people don't, and they just do that chest pounding, and then it falls on deaf ears. You know, there's a really interesting uh, – there was a Stanford PhD candidate uh, a couple of years ago. I was listening to a pod, Stephen Ronella's podcast, Meat Eater. And uh, it's very interesting because he had a guest on who's a PhD candidate from Stanford in uh, political communications. Hmm. And he was doing a study on how, and he was a big hunter, and he was trying to uh, help people in the hunting world more effectively message why they enjoy hunting and why they do it uh, to people who were historically opposed to that activity. And so when you ask people, when you would ask people things like, well, I like to hunt because I, it's my Second Amendment right to carry a gun if I want to. And if, and I like to hunt because my grandpa and I did it growing up, and it's my family tradition. Or I like to hunt because I like to be out in nature. Or I, it's effective herd management, wildlife management, conservation. People are people who are, are, are opposed to those activities aren't – the needle is not moved at all. It's not persuasive to them. But if you, if, if you don't listen to someone else, you're never going to be able to, to learn how to better message to them to get right what on. you want across to them. And so, you know, there are, so the way we message in the gun world is, is really poor. And we take our lead from the NRA, who I think is historically one of the poorest messaging organizations around, because it's not, it's not messaging about the Second Amendment. It's messaging to scare the heck out of you to raise more money. Right and, what that PhD candidate found is when he changed the question to be, or the change the way people would argue to anti hunting folks. I like to, I like to hunt because it gives me a clean, more honest, uh, authentic relationship with my food. And I like to be able to provide my children with antibiotic free hormone, hormone free protein source. Uh, okay. They're on board. They're more respective of your right. So right. knowing that people, there's a way to communicate our interest in firearms. We can't ever learn how to do it in an effective way if we don't listen to other people who are opposed to it and find out why they are, they are against it. Maybe we're, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. But, yeah. you know, right now we, everybody just yells their messaging at each other and mm -hmm. nobody tries to tailor the message for, the, for the right day. audience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's a big issue I think with, with many hot button topics. And the one thing I try to remind folks of is it's okay if somebody thinks guns should be banned. It's okay because that's that 
other U.S. citizen's right to feel that way. Just mm-hmm. like you may be a Methodist and he's a Catholic and he's a Jew and he's a Muslim. It's their right to think that. And you don't maybe even have to convince them you're right. If you can't understand that it's their right to disagree with you, I think that's the biggest problem. It's uh, in this genre, people that are pro-gun feel that if you don't agree with them, you're basically the devil. Well, yeah, and, and you know, uh, we, we had a podcast with uh, Colonel Allen West uh, mm-hmm. at Shot Show last year. He made a great observation. He said when when, he, when people talk, they come up to him and get all aggressive, you know, because he's well known stance, you know, positive for the Second Amendment. And people come from you know, he's an African American man, and they come to him from the perspective of you know, oh, guns are terrible. They're you know all this. He uh, he he describes it as a civil right, and he he wants an expansion of our civil rights. He wants that African-American grandmother on the south side of Chicago to be able to have a gun in her home to defend herself when she's in the midst of one of the, you know, the, the highest murder rates in, the, in an area where it's essentially like Syria. Shouldn't she be able to exercise the same civil right as me, a uh, right. m- middle-aged white guy in Oklahoma? I think she should. And right. th- that really is a far more effective message than it's my right. You know, let's make it about somebody who is marginalized and disenfranchised by people who are opposed to the Second Amendment rather than, you know, some guy who wants to, to see how many ARs I can accumulate. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the type of messaging that we really need to change. I was fortunate to become somewhat friends with Otis McDonald uh, before he passed away. McDonald versus uh, the city of Illinois, Chicago. Yeah, and, yeah he was... Uh, Yes, it is, in fact, Illinois, but he's started there in the city. Right. Because the city had the only handgun ban that was, like, really still standing in the whole state. And you just mentioned NRA. I've been on a, a recent rant protecting NRA. And I wasn't – I only bring this up because that case was funded for and won by NRA membership dollars, right. uh, which wasn't – I only bring that up because while they are imperfect for sure, it's a common goal that we all have. We got to kind of like sort that out, whatever the common goal is. That's why I'm a member. Yeah, they're kind of they're they're kind of like the ACLU in that uh, you know they're they're easy to criticize and but yet serve a a vital role when they're on your side. Right on. Yeah, I could write a thesis on all the things I disagree with, and I have voiced it to friends of mine that are on the board, but it's a it's a monster, just like government or any huge corporation of that many people. That's a, it's a, a, a ship that does not change course very easily by any means. But I, I think what's most important about this conversation that I'd like listeners to leave with is regardless of who you are, what you do, if you're going to deploy lethal force or, or uh, uh, carry a weapon for it, insurance or not, understand the law, be justified if need be, and have a plan to not do that, to de-escalate, to avoid, to use verbal judo and, and keep yourself out of it. Because most of the time, I, I, in my experience, I've never had to shoot somebody, and I hope I never have to, but I've had encounters where I know other people would have probably drawn a gun Not because I'm so special and handled myself, but I didn't have to. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, and one thing, too, that goes along with that is uh, you take good care of yourself. Uh, You know, you exercise, and you're you're not going to get that gun taken away from you, uh, more than likely. And people need to recognize that the better physical conditioning that you're in, uh, you're better able to handle stress. Uh, you know, you're, there's physiological reactions to stress that, that can make you more apt to continue to, to make uh, choices and think and process information that's coming at you uh, very quickly in an experience you've never had before. You know, that, the better physical conditioning you're in, you're going to make better choices. In law enforcement, we used to have a saying one of my old training sergeants did. He said you should have a soft focus, and the only way that you can make sure you're you don't get tunnel vision as you breathe and you get a soft focus and that allows you to re-engage your peripheral vision and you can see other threats. But in training, we often are, uh, you know, we get conditioned to that paper target and then yeah. they tell you to look left and look right and look behind you. And that's why you do that because 
in those situations, your aptitude not you're overwhelmed. And if you don't create that muscle memory of literally making sure that what your surroundings are, you know, you're apt to miss something else. Uh, so it's, I just always like to throw in there physical conditioning is a really, you don't have to go be able to run a marathon, but it, the better shape you're in, you're going to be able to handle that. These are incredibly uh, dynamic situations that can uh, cause tremendous physical stress, heart attacks, panic attacks, yeah. When someone is trying to kill you, it's not like it is on the range where you're just sitting there going to go on autopilot and put two in the chest and one in the head. You're going to experience things physically you never, ever have before. And, uh, you know, we don't, and as civilians, go out in the world mentally prepared to experience the worst thing that's ever happened to us. You know, in law enforcement, you at met least my you know that's your job. Yeah. You met my ex-wife? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't met mine either. So, uh, but yeah, so you, 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 you can be prepared to an extent, but you also have part of that is, is you got to be able to breathe. You got to be able to, uh, uh, be able to create distance for yourself. One of the things that I encourage people to, to look at this on our website, uh, we have a lot of, uh, of educational content, uh, cause we want the highest educated members that we possibly can. Uh, it's good for business. It's good for the firearms community. But our co-founder, Mike Darter, he's also a former uh, police officer. He uh, has a long-standing, uh, you know, non-lethal training experiences and such as, uh, you know, judo, jiu-jitsu, that type of thing. And he, in law enforcement, we had something called use of force continuum. In the military, you would have something called rules of engagement. And they're wildly different depending on the circumstances you're in for the military. But a use of force continuum is it's essentially, it's the thing that defines how you escalate, how force escalates to deadly force. And what we see is people go from somebody pissed me off to deadly force. Right. And if you pull that gun out, you're, you're now saying this situation demands deadly force. And but there's all these other steps that, that, are, that are there in the use of force continuum. It's a, it's a continuum that is, allows you to react uh, in a fluid environment. And so uh, it really is important to, for civilians for us to adopt the similar mindset what law enforcement has. So we have on our website a civilian uh, use of force continuum that I would really encourage people to, uh, to familiarize themselves with and make that a part of what you are so wise to have on your, on your website as, as a mindset. Awareness, mindset, those are all incredibly important steps that are involved in making that decision tree of, of uh, whether you're going to uh, – uh, have to have to. Uh, uh, will you be justified in pulling a gun out? Will you be justified sure. in using it? And Mick, <laughs> touching on that, if, if if you share your your affiliate link, uh, tell your members that I mean your customers and your students that they can access our website and sign up for those n newsletters without becoming a member. Oh, without, very cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, so and and receive that information for free. Very yeah, we'll throw all that information up here on this podcast before it goes up. A couple of things I'd add to that. I, I agree with everything that both of you guys have been saying. That idea of physical fitness from a philosophical standpoint, take out the, uh, uh, the pragmatic aspect of being able to win in violence. If you truly care about living a long, full life, are you smoking two packs of cigs a day, living off fast food, can't see your... your uh, your uh, shoes while you're trying to tie them. You know, I had to clean that up a little bit. But yeah. you guys get what I'm saying. And that, I, I think is a, is a, is a, it's interesting to me. I'll have guys come to the range, and I'm not picking on somebody for being overweight, but I'll have a guy show up with $5,000 of gear, in a, uh, and he's all tactical timmied out, and he's 200 pounds overweight, and he's got a, a, a two-liter bottle of Mountain Dew for his beverage on the range. And you, you look and it's like, wait a second, man. Like, clearly you are not doing this because you want to live. You're not. You're doing right. it because it's sexy, fun, it boosts your ego, something like that. And, I, and, I, and I'll bring it to their attention, usually in private, but that's the other thing. Like, it, it kind of indicates the, the, like, true mindset behind where some – go ahead. I was just going to say, and as you age, something that I'm starting to face that I never gave any consideration to, that becomes harder and harder. I'm in my 60s now, and and trying to stay physically fit and, and trying to stay mentally attuned at all times, uh, it, it becomes more difficult. 
I know you guys know who Colonel Cooper was. I, I, mm -hmm. if I, I don't want to butcher it, but over his mantle, the sconce, he called it, he had engraved in that sconce uh, a quote from the Battle of Maldon. As our might lessons, this was this aging king that wrote this, yeah. as our might lessons, our, our heart and mind must grow the bolder. Yeah. That's pretty pretty good quote. And he was, you know, in his seventies or so when I think he had that thing engraved in there, but telling yeah. of that, that, that spirit of the warrior, not just about the, the tools or the sword, but truly what's deep yeah. inside mo motivating the person. And to help you survive after the fight as well. You yeah. Know, a lot of people think about it up to the fight, but if you end up using deadly force, if you end up taking a life or even narrowly escaping with your own life, the, the, the stress factors that you will carry at least through the criminal process and then possibly through the civil process and then years down the, the, the road. Yeah. yeah. Um, it all takes a toll. Yeah, Mickey, I, I know you probably were running out of time, but I did want to share one issue that we had with you that were, uh, we had a member who was involved, who was, uh, had, had an exchange with a neighbor and had a, took it, fired around at him because he felt he was shot at, wound up being the neighbor, uh, the bad guy neighbor had fired at him with an air gun. So they dropped, uh, the charges. Like a, like a BB dropped. gun kind of a, yes. Uh, uh, dropped the charges. Well, later the the neighbor wound up uh, and murdered our member. Okay, Holy so smokes. Li me, literally, yeah, back, it was happening in southwestern Colorado. These, these two and, dudes are having an argument. I want to make sure I understand. Two neighbors having an argument. Whatever. Keep your garbage off my driveway. Some something. And I'm sure it's been something that had been building. They're, they're, yard, they're arguing from their one yard to the other and your member what did he hear a, uh, a projectile impact the house around him or something he heard a shot okay what he thought was a shot so uh he and he returned fire hit the side of the guy's house it calls the police the police show up can't find any evidence that the guy had shot at him and so they arrested him later they believe that the guy may have actually shot at him with an air rifle so they d dropped the charges against our member we had bailed him out hired him a lawyer and everything and uh, we're defending him. And uh, so they dropped the charges. A month later, the, the neighbor, bad guy, had faked uh, a situation. He, he killed the member by somehow getting him to his property. He, he held a bar. This is a crazy story. He held a barbecue for his, he and his wife's family. People showed up and people were uh, around like one of those outdoor tent type things, you know, where he was cooking. And he, he starts walking over to the edge of his property and says, He's got a gun and starts firing rounds out into the side of the hill. And then all, the family freaks out and leaves. The, the bad guy neighbor jumps in his car with his wife. They also leave. And uh, two days later, drive back to their residence, call the Colorado State Police and say, well, we, we had this situation where we shot at this guy. So the cops come with them. They begin walking the perimeter of his property. Lo and behold, there's our member dead on the ground with a, a handgun with his finger on the trigger. And the body had obviously been moved. There was uh, physical evidence, blood evidence to show that the body had been positioned. And that's what it's a, a very bizarre story. Wow. And they're, the man and his wife are now charged with first degree murder in, in Colorado. I'm uh, assuming Pagosa Springs or was it Pagosa Springs. Pagosa Springs. And so, so the, the moral to that story is. You know, when you're going to uh, have a, a fight with a neighbor, a fight with the person in the car in front of you, you never know who that person is. You know, you just never, ever know. And, you know, there are crazy people out in this world who, and you, if you put yourself on their radar, you know, that, that is a place you don't want to be, uh, not only for your safety, but for that of your family as well. We use the reasonable man doctrine in our class. You guys know it well. we'll be, we are judged by the actions of a prudent and reasonable person. And I explain this to folks when don't assume everybody you meet is reasonable and prudent. That's like the long and the short of it. I have a, a guy I grew up with has been to prison five times, maybe six, for very violent things. He broke the arm of a cop that was arresting him once. Uh, he's... Uh, uh, had a motorcycle stolen by a rival motorcycle gang and literally went into their like biker hangout 
with a by himself to get his bike back and got beat to almost death, but like beat the heck out of four or five guys, just straight up psycho. And that's that's the kind of guys that are out there in the world. Holy You're smokes, right. that's a horrible story. That is a horrible yeah. story. And the way we found out about it is we had uh, he did not call us until after he'd bailed himself out of jail, our member in the in the initial incident. And so we had uh, reimbursed him his uh, bell fee and the check got returned to us a month later. Uh, he had no family. He was a retired federal uh, law enforcement officer. He had no family. So a friend of his was helped up into finalize the affairs of his estate. And uh, wow. so w- when we got the How check sad. back, we reached out to them and they, they told us what happened. Sure enough, it's in the, it's in the uh, media as well. So is this, this is, uh, this is not that long ago. Is that, neighbor locked up right now the yes the, yeah i haven't checked on it in a few months but he was pending trial the last time i checked on it so that's one of those things back to the some of the stuff we were talking about earlier if you don't have to be there don't be there there's if there's certain people if, I, if, if i've already think somebody shot at me with a bb gun i'm blind in my right eye from 10 years old from a kid shooting me in the face with a pellet gun and spent days in intensive care if somebody's already shot at me, I'm probably not palling around with them at a barbecue. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's terrible. It was a crazy situation. I wanted to mention one thing before we go. We're talking about the use of force continuum. I think people need to understand that that continuum can go all the way around. Like I may draw and point a gun at you and you drop or decease in whatever your felonious action is. I don't need to still shoot you. I can revert all the way back to holstering my gun and calling the police or running away or whatever. It doesn't have to go from A to Z and that's where it stops. Just wanted to make sure we got that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great way of looking at it. The escalation never stops. I mean, it, uh, up until the point of deadly force, you're still a, attempting de-escalation. A, a young man, one of our students this past year called me. I could hear the tremble in his voice. He was in the city, uh, pulled up to a stoplight with his girlfriend in a halfway decent part of town. He's in, getting a big Dodge truck, hands on the wheel, dark out. All of a sudden, the whole back window of his truck blows up. And he said it was really loud. He th- didn't know if uh, like somebody threw something or he even thought like a car might have hit him. And he looks in his side mirror and there's a guy walking up the side of his truck with a bat. He had broke out the back of his window. And so he immediately grabbed his pistol, opened the door, and he said he was on the trigger. He's like, Mick, I was a, like, I don't know how I didn't shoot him, but he told the guy stop and it pressed the gun out and he heard the aluminum bat bounce off the street and he deceased and stopped. And a uh, 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 guy ended up laying on the ground. Cops came. There was two of them. They were uh, heroin junkies trying to hold people up for, for money. But he didn't have to shoot him. And I don't know if anybody would have judged him if he did. It was fractions of a second, but he was mentally aware of what was happening and was able to stop some junkie from dying. So it doesn't always have to go there. It's a lot easier if it doesn't usually. You're absolutely Absolutely. right. My friend, Jared Reston, you guys know Reston? I know the Reston group. Yeah, I know who he is. Jared's a good dude. Jared has a shirt that says, uh, a a life will well lived. Uh, loving a good woman and killing a bad man. So maybe sometimes there are certain men that need killing, but I don't want it to be me. We'll yeah, to me nor, nor do we. Yeah. And don't yeah. have that shirt on when you're involved in it. <laughs> yeah. <instead>. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, how do people find you? So of course on carrytrainer.com, we've got a link up where people can click that link, go straight to you and purchase a policy, sign up uh, for coverage. But also what's your main website? ccwsafe.com and uh on that website they're going to find out all the pros and cons some comparisons to other people in the business i know you guys have a handout that's got basically cut and dry facts and figures yeah is you guys update that i i have people on the internet constantly remind me that my my facts are not updated yeah the short and sweet on it is we pay 100 percent of criminal civil and administrative defense costs. We pay it up front, no reimbursement. We don't have a limit on the amount we will pay for a defense. Uh, Our standard bond is $500,000. We pay the fee on a bond set up to 500,000 that's upgradable to a million. 
Uh, we also have optional civil liability. All of that's right there, and uh, they can email us if they have any questions or give me a call. You uh, you have my number, and anybody mm -hmm. that wants it's welcome to it. So long and the short of it, if we take and look down that list and somebody says XYZ company that's advertised all over the internet supposed to be the best, what would make yours better? A hundred percent upfront, no limits. Uh, that lets out several of them. Uh, second is we're not a reimbursement. We, we pay it upfront. So some of those companies, I have to pay it. I got to go to the bank. I got to borrow money from a family member. And then you would, not you, but the other company would reimburse me after I was found not guilty. If you were found not guilty. Okay. But if you, if you were accept, let's say you were charged with manslaughter and they offered you a plea of uh, disturbing the peace of the misdemeanor and no jail time served. If you said, oh, great, I'll take that plea. You're not getting any of your money back. Gotcha. Yeah. So, but with our model, we and we another thing too. I, I wanted to point out. I'm I'm an insurance nerd. Uh, it's the world that I live in. But I could we we yeah, we deliberately did not choose what's called a wasting policy. And a lot of our competitors, if anything, they have is back even backed by insurance at all. It's a wasting policy. And what that means is the exp early we were talking about two buckets. There's the expense bucket and the indemnity bucket. On this is if you have civil liability protection. And we provide that up to a million dollars, and it's not a wasting policy. In other words, if your lawyer bills bills four hundred thousand dollars, and we pay all that, that does not uh, deduct four hundred thousand dollars from your amount of indemnity coverage. On, on if we had to settle your case or pay a verdict, it's always a okay. million dollars. So, okay. but, but a lot of policies to get cheaper, they uh, they they're wasting policies. So uh, every all the expenses come out of how much they would have paid on the coverage. I see. And one other thing I'd say real quick, Nick, is if, if everybody's coverage was identical, let's say every competitor, and they're not, uh, you can go to the, each of the competitors' websites and look at their, their, their limits uh, and their issues. I will tell people to read the fine print, too, because some of that stuff is written kind of salesy. And if we were all 100% equal, the thing that separates us is experience. We've, we not only experience an actual uh, handling of cases as a business, but the core that this business is built on uh, from Kyle's experience in the civil world, Don's experience in the criminal world, all of us having been involved in, in critical incidents ourselves. I like that. Uh, we've got um, over a hundred years of law enforcement experience between us. Uh, we send people to you if you're involved in an incident. The others don't. We, we you will see my smiling face uh, after an incident. Myself or one of our other representatives. And, I like it. And in in short order. I hear sometimes guys will call me because they'll see, I'll do a video on this and they'll say, hey man, you're misrepresenting this other company's got the same coverage or better. And I, I say, hey man, I've looked, I've, I've opened up, not looked at just the stuff that you guys have posted, but I'll open it up on two different windows. I'll, I've even wrote the stuff down and looked at the fine print and, and I'm not any genius, but I'm not stupid. And so that's why I'm repeating this. If you, you have to look at the totality of it. I can... I can uh, write something well, that it looks a certain way, but usually different criteria has to be met, like what Kyle just said upon a guilty verdict versus yeah. maybe a plea or something. That's what I encourage everybody to do, to go, go to each of the competitor's website and look at what's covered. What's a defense cost? Yeah. A lot of them, it's the attorney fees. With us, attorney fees, experts, uh, some of them offer expert coverage at an additional cost. Uh, private investigators. In the Maddox case, we spent $50,000 on private investigators. Let's uh, do a quick, quick hypothetical. I know you guys have been on here an hour. So, so a member shoots somebody. It's not cut and dry where there's no charges because if it's cut and dry, you guys never get involved, right, usually? Uh, we, the, the one we've got going from... Uh, last week is uh, as close to a cut and dry as I've seen. Uh, we rolled out a critical response on that. We've okay. got we've already hired attorneys and it just to get him through the interview process. 
Let, let me rephrase that. What I should have said is if it's cut and dry, the guy's probably not going to jail. He's not, it's not something that he's going to have charges filed on him. He's he got the proverbial nine camera angles and good witnesses and the, it's an airtight case. But when it's something that maybe doesn't have the witnesses or something, guys involved in a, 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 some type of self-defense scenario, we'll say it's me. I've had to defend myself in a dark parking lot from a bad guy. It's me and him. I call the police after the fact. This offender's down. 911. I call, and then I call you. Gary, I can't believe this has happened. This is terrible. How does that unfold from there? Well, the first thing first is you're, you're going to call our hotline, and you're going to be patched in to uh, – No, I'm calling Gary's personal cell phone. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and I'm going to say you need to call Kyle. Yeah. And so we will have, uh, there's about 15 of us who the call goes to. Uh, so what we will, uh, more than likely, like the Maddox case, it, he was, he called from, uh, from the jail. I answered the phone and we immediately, uh, it was two 30 in the morning and we had, uh, one of our critical response coordinators at the time in, uh, in the town where he was by, uh, the middle of the, of that afternoon. And his, and it was a Sunday now and his, and we got his, uh, Don West uh, hired his lawyers. Uh, they showed up on that Sunday afternoon to the jail house to interview him and meet with him and, uh, and begin his defense. And that is rural North Carolina, not an easy place to, uh, necessarily to get to. So, uh, and, and immediately we begin, we meet with the lawyers and we have what's called billing guidelines and we establish how the case is going to be managed. And it's important because sometimes you'll you'll have lawyers who haven't had necessarily the experience of uh, of a large you know potentially even a capital uh, level case. Uh, so we push we want to we need to know what type of resources they're going to need from us. Uh, we and invariably they're always blown away by not only the experience we have and the help we can provide them uh, in the in the defense and the preparation of witnesses and things, but in the willingness to incur a significant expense on behalf of our member. Sometimes, you know, when you're going to trial, you may need five expert witnesses, and depending on the way the court rules on the evidence, you may not be able to call a, a, a someone a use of force expert. Ultimately, they're going to make an opinion about whether it was a justified shooting or not. We may have paid that guy thirty thousand dollars to uh, to have gone through all the evidence. Uh, you know, in some case, some states like Florida, for instance, there's the criminal cases. You're allowed discovery. In other words, depositions. So reading depositions is a very expensive thing to do. So we, in the Maddox case, we had two experts that we didn't even wind up calling at trial. So we'd spent $30,000, have two people uh, and you know, subject matter experts that we did not even wind up calling. And so that's all that process is done throughout. We arranged the bell bonds, negotiated the rate, and had our member out of jail. We actually had to force the hearing uh, to have a bond hearing because the, the uh the prosecutor wanted no bond. So not only we fought to be able to pay uh, a half a million dollar bond. So, you know, it's, it's an everyday function. We know that this is the most important substantive thing that have ever happened to one of our members. And it is our mission is our reason for being is to provide every service that we can to get them out and get them away from the consequences of the legal system. You know what I'm hearing and it's not salesy and it's not cause I, use the service myself. I hear quality. I've been self-employed for years. And uh, one thing that always kept me busy was I advertised my cell phone number. And people would say to me, doesn't that annoy you? And I always said, well, I want somebody that wants to buy what I'm selling to be able to get a hold of me. So you guys have a great system set up to your opening story here where your, your competitor spent a week, hasn't called their their client or customer. So uh, I want, I want now, especially if I'm sitting in the clink and my wife's wondering where the heck I'm at. So that's what I hear. And that was one of the things that got me to uh, connect with you guys to begin with, like worst time of my life. I'm probably freaking out. Family's freaking out. I don't want some, maybe I want whatever the best case scenario is. I tell people when they ask me, like, why did you go with them? I say, hey, if I needed to have surgery, I'm not going to go to the local hospital and say, who's your average guy? 
I call my brother-in-law that's in the medical field and say, who's the best freaking dude, you know, in shoulder surgeries or whatever it is. And that's who we, we go see. I got a fly to go get him. Good. That's the guy I want to cut on me. So that's kind of what you guys are to, in my opinion, you're the specialist of the specialist. Some of the other dudes in this field, if you look at the backgrounds that they came from, it's interesting at best. It's different. Yeah. Difference, a good word. And it's not an insult. It just would make me think like, you know, my, if my auto mechanic was a couple months later, my shoulder surgeon, I would be questioning the authenticity <laughs> of product. Well, we've yeah. all, one thing, you know, we're in the business of being responsive to people who've had to make a use of force decision. We've all made those ourselves. We've all been to shooting scenes. You know, Gary and I still, to this day, uh, represent uh, police officers when they've been involved in shootings. And we take call every three months in our metropolitan area of over a million people. So we were working uh, for many hours preparing a, a young police officer just a couple of weeks ago for shooting. We went to the scene. Uh, you know, we, that's what we do. Uh, and this is not something, you know, where we hope someday when one of these happens, we'll be able to rise to the occasion. You know, we train for this all the time. We have, uh, it, we have retreats where we get together and, and, and have to, uh, come up with a response to a uh, hypothetical uh, situation somewhere because we want to make sure that we are improving our, our processes all the time. Nobody's perfect, uh, but that's our goal. And, and so the only way we can get better is uh, contemplating scenarios uh, and, and, and all that and customizing our service as much as possible. The other cool thing for all of this value, it almost sounds too good to be true not to blow smoke, your prices are as good or better than all of the other folks out there, tit for tat, if you or not tit for tat, but if you're looking at higher level services, your prices are comparable or better. That's fantastic. It's yeah, not really this great level of service. We, Say that again, sell, we really only have two plans. We don't sell multi-tiered, buy more coverage. Our mm -hmm. basic plan covers 100% up front. Yeah. Uh, we've got two plans that are identical, one discounted for law enforcement military. Uh, and then we have an ultimate plan, which is a bundled plan and then discounted. So we don't, we don't get you on board and then try to upsell you to, uh, buy additional coverage. You can get this much coverage for this price, or you can buy this much for a much inflated price. I dig it. And you guys have like good old boy kind of Southern drawl, which makes people <laughs> too. Uh, Gary, Gary does. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I hate listening. One of the things I hated the most in law enforcement was when I had to sponsor a videotaped interview of myself in court and then have to listen to myself going, hey, y'all, where you all at when this happened? <laughs> That's good stuff. I appreciate your time, guys. I know this is going to be a well-listened to podcast. I, I know you guys pump out a lot of stuff like this. Maybe in the future, we could dedicate some time and just answer some questions that sure. we have from viewers. I could take a handful of those and uh, you guys just pick them apart from your your uh, uh, perspective and, and pass on that information in the future. Uh, I'll definitely... Yeah, fantastic. So any of you folks listening, we'll put a link up here if, for more info on this. And like Gary said, even if you don't sign up, which is a tremendous resource, you can sign up just for their newsletters to get all of that free information, which I think, in my opinion, you're further building a case that you are a conscientious citizen that is looking at reading, learning, uh, uh, about the legal and ethical use of force versus maybe reading things like how to be a mall ninja superhero or whatever. Right. Yeah. Parting thoughts, guys, anything you'd like to add before I cut you loose? No, I think we covered. We really appreciate you having us. Thank you very much, Mickey. And it, if any of the people have, have uh, questions, uh, you know, we have a lot of content on our website. We also are responsive. We have a non-emergency, you know, hotline number that they can call and, we feel calls all the time, myself included, as, as a general counsel. We, we want people to be able to make these informed uh, decisions. Fantastic. Gary, how about you? You got anything? Uh, feel free to put out my email. It's Gary, G-A-R-Y, at ccwsafe.com. If anybody emails me, they'll receive my uh, phone number and my, uh, and my reply. Uh, I encourage everyone to check out 
all the competitors and then come see why we're the best. I like it. I agree. Dudes, I appreciate it. I, uh, I'll get you a link to this when we get it done. Folks, if you're watching this on YouTube, we sub, uh, ask you to subscribe to the channel. Pass this kind of stuff on to your friends and loved ones, not because it's going to help us out, which it will a little bit, but it's going to help out your friends and loved ones by giving them information that can keep them safe, keep them out of jail, and help them live a long, full life. Tell somebody you love them. Be well. Stay safe, Mick. Peace. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or kerrytrainer.com.